Are you thinking of heading off on a motorhome or caravan European adventure? What do you need to pack? What paperwork do you need? What do you need to do to your vehicle to make sure that it's ready for the trip as well? Well, in this guide, we will unpack the list of stuff that you need to know to ensure that you have a fantastic European holiday. Preparing for any trip in a motorhome or caravan is essential, but planning a European holiday is critical. Since we left the EU, a number of things have changed. There are some new requirements and there are some things which are no longer a requirement. And travelling to Europe, therefore, can seem a little bit daunting, but it needn't be. My recommendation is get yourself a checklist and you can get our free checklist at www.thatleisureshop.com forward slash Europe. So in this first section, I'm going to take you through your paperwork. Now, the obvious first thing you need is a passport, one for every person traveling, no matter how old they are. This is my British passport. It's still valid in Europe. It's the burgundy one. When this expires, it will be replaced by a blue European one. Now, really important is not the expiry date of the passport, but the start date. Your passport must be valid for 10 years from the start date. When you return to the UK, you must have at least three months left to run. Now, some British passports, when they were issued, had longer expiry dates than 10 years. Some were even 10 years and nine months. A customs officer will ignore that nine months. So check your passport. When was the start date? If you're going on a month long holiday, you need to have four months left on your passport before it expires in order to come back into the UK. Some people say that you should have at least six months left on your passport before trying to re-enter the UK. That's up to you, but check where you're going and, and how long you will have left on your passport. You must also make sure you've got blank pages in it as your passport's gonna get stamped when you enter the EU and when you leave. Here is a stamp. This is me entering the United Arab Emirates. If your passport is full of stamps, there's gonna be no room for a new one and you're gonna upset the customs officer I've been there and done that, had to apply for a new passport. So make sure you've got space for the customs officer to stamp it. And then of course you must take your photo driving license. This is the pink credit card one. If you don't have one of these and you're still using the green paper license, I would consider getting, in fact you would need to get an international driving permit. If you have the pink driving license, you don't need one. But critical is again, you check the expiration date. These expire every 10 years. So check that your license is still valid before you go. And then you need to think about health insurance or travel insurance. Now you can apply for a European health insurance card uh, or certificate. Um, it looks like this, it's blue. Uh, you can apply for a global one as well. They're definitely worth having. If you've got one already, it will still be valid uh, until obviously it expires. But I would encourage you to take proper independent, privately sourced health insurance or travel insurance. Make sure it's got repatriation and consider as well what vehicle or vehicles are you going in because that can form part of your travel policy and make sure everyone in the party is named on that policy, including any health conditions that they might have. You can obtain a global health insurance card for free from the NHS website. It's also worth noting that your British passport will give you free healthcare cover in Norway. Thank you, Norway. From mid 2023, you will need to apply for an ETIAS visa waiver. This stands for a European Travel Information and Authorization System, and they are seven euros for anyone aged 18 to 70. If you're under 18 or over 70, you must still apply, but they are free. All ETIAS holders and travellers will be able to enter the 27 member states of the Schengen Zone as well as Bulgaria, Cyprus and Romania. You can find out more at etias.info. That's E-T-I-A-S dot info. My other tip would be to check the British government website at gov.uk for any foreign travel advice that might exist at the time you're planning your holiday. That might be travel restrictions due to health, politics or even conflict. So you can check that at the Foreign Travel Advice website on Gov.uk. If you're planning that one of the members of your party is your dog, then that's a whole different presentation from me. You need to have what's called a pet health certificate. So really important that you plan ahead. 
All right? Cool. One of the biggest changes since we left the EU is a restriction on us Brits to only spend 90 days in Europe in any 180 days. What does that mean? It means you can arrive, spend three months or specifically 90 days on the continent and then you must leave. That could mean you come home or you could go to a non-EU, non-Schengen country for a further 90 days. Once those 180 days have passed, you are then welcome to go back into the Schengen zone. And that's noted by the visa stamp in your passport. Now, many customs officers are not really checking the passport, and I know people that have stayed there welcome and stayed for over the 90 days. There are reports of a fine of around 100 euros if you do that. The worst that could happen is probably you get a red flag stamp in your passport, which might mean it's very difficult to get back into Europe in the future. Now, you don't necessarily have to come home back to the UK for that 90 day break. You could go to a number of other countries, Andorra in the Pyrenees, Monaco in France, uh, San Marino in Italy, or even North Africa if your insurance cover permits it. But be mindful that some of these lesser mentioned zones in Europe uh, don't have border control. So achieving a passport stamp could be very tricky. If that was the case, how do you prove you'd taken that 90 day break out of Europe. So plan your trip, that's the most important thing. Plan your trip that you are gonna get a 90 day break. If you are with a partner and you're married and they have a European passport, they might have an Irish passport for example, then you are exempt from this rule and you can stay in Europe over the 90 days. I know a lot of Brits right now who are applying for French citizenship so that they can have a longer break in Europe. So. Back to the list, really important you take your tickets, whether you've printed them, if you're going on the Channel Tunnel, this is an example ticket. They have an app as well on your phone, so you don't even have to print the ticket, you just take them on your phone. Whether you take the tunnel or a ferry is entirely up to you. We often take the Channel Tunnel because it's cheaper, but it does often make our trip longer. So we live in the southwest of England, traveling across to Dover, and then if we're going to Western France, means we're adding about 10 or 12 hours onto our trip. So sometimes taking the ferry, whilst more expensive, can save us a significant amount of time. Another big benefit of taking the ferry is that the driver gets a break. And if you're taking an overnight crossing, then you get a chance to have a good sleep before you hit the road in, once you're in France. Now there are different rules for different countries. For example, if you're going to Portugal and you're seen driving in, they will ask to see your spare driving glasses. This is a legal requirement in Portugal. I don't need to wear glasses when I'm driving, but if you do, you must make sure you've got a spare pair of glasses to hand. Also, whilst in Portugal, dash cams are illegal. So make sure you take it out of the windscreen and hide it. They will stop you. The police there really don't like them. Driving in France, it is illegal to use any hands-free device on a telephone. You're not allowed to touch your phone and you're not allowed to have anything in your ear that enables you to answer it hands-free. This is a recent law, so be mindful the police are looking for law breakers. Staying in France, if you are thinking of driving into a city, although I wouldn't recommend it, I'd encourage you to camp outside and get public transport into the city, you will need a clean air zone sticker. These are some examples, they're called Criter, and they tell the authorities what rating your vehicle is in terms of emissions. You must display them in the bottom right corner of the windscreen. If you don't, yet again, you will get a fine. So make sure you apply for one of these online. They are a few euros. There are some onerous websites charging tens of pounds or even hundreds of pounds for one of these, totally unnecessary. They are literally a few euros and you must display one if you're driving into a clean air zone. And the list of countries in France that are being impacted by this is growing, so check the website for more information. Another recent rule is a restriction on what we can take into France by means of fresh meat, dairy and plant-based foods. If you have a dog with you and they're on a fresh meat diet, you are permitted to take one day's worth of food. And if you need fresh meat or dairy product for medical reasons or baby milk, for example, that's permitted too. If you need it for medical reasons, I would encourage you to take the evidence to back up why you've got it. 
but these products are obviously widely available on the continent. Audi, Lidl are both prolific, as is the supermarket Carrefour. So you can Google what they sell in terms of finding the best food for your dog. I cannot get my head around the plant-based food. I don't really know what they're referring to. I know dairy milk is gonna be safe. That's not an issue, so your chocolate is fine to take with you. Mobile phones in Europe. So if you have roaming on your phone contract, you're gonna be able to use it in Europe. There is now though a daily charge from your phone provider, probably around five pounds per day, but really check your phone contract before you go and make sure you've got that set up. I would also encourage you to contact your bank and make sure they don't stop your card when you're using a credit card or debit card on the continent. Just let them know you're going and then your card shouldn't be blocked. You might want to open a Starling bank account which charges zero in terms of fees for any transaction. They're really easy to open and they're a very cost effective way of spending money when you're on the continent. Also keep your coins, you are going to need euros for toll booths and you're going to need euros on some campsites to pay for some facilities, but more on that in a minute. Depending on what time of year you head off to the continent means you might need to consider your tyres. If you're going in the winter from the 1st of November to the 31st of March, you must have snow tyres, snow chains, you must have spiked tyres or what are called tyre socks and they must be fitted or ready to be fitted. And the areas where you must fit them are signposted and this is because of severe snow and ice on the roads. Now, my tip is make sure you buy the right size and fit them before you head off. That's the mistake I made. Uh, and there is a 135 euro fine if you're caught not wearing them in the appropriate zone. I should add, when I say not wearing them, I mean your motorhome tires, not you. So then where are you staying? Now, when you arrive in France, you might be asked for two things. One is evidence of your accommodation, so proof that you've got somewhere to stay. And the other is that you have reasonable financial means to survive the trip and get back. So having a campsite booked for your first few nights is a very sensible idea. Don't say you're wild camping if you haven't got anywhere booked and you're planning on using an air, and I'll explain what they are in a second. In terms of financial means, the customs officer may just ask to see a debit or credit card. They're not gonna ask you to get a box of cash out and demonstrate to them you've got funds with you, but they will ask you, have you got means to spend while you're here and get home in a hurry if you need to. So what is an air? Well, an air is a municipal owned site, so a council owned site, often in a place with a beautiful view. They're often free or sometimes just five or 10 euros, and many have facilities on them, so power, electric and water for your motorhome, and somewhere that you can dump your grey waste. Uh, my advice is get to them early. So we would travel in the morning and get to them at lunchtime because they often fill up. On an air, you are not allowed to get your awning out, get your table and chairs out, make a barbecue. That's not what they are for. That is for a campsite. But they are a very, very convenient way of spending a night. And we always head off the main roads, off of the motorway, into the villages and look for an air. And as I say, we try and check in at lunchtime early because during the afternoon they do fill up. Now, one of our favourite things to take with us is our Axi membership. Uh, this, there's a whole episode on the Motorhome Map podcast about this. This gives you access to a whole range of campsites across Europe, often half price outside of peak season, and they are fantastic. There's lots and lots of information on there. There's different levels of membership. There's a phone app and the book. We always take the book, leave it in the glove box. And then if you haven't got network, you've got something you can reference. So the next bit is your motorhome paperwork. Now the V5 is the red and blue document. This is a copy, you must take an original. If you're hiring a motorhome or a car, then you will be given by the hire company or you must apply for a VE103R. But this is, gives you a form in lieu of an uh, V5. The hire company may not want you to have the original V5. You must also take a valid MOT certificate. And again, it must be in date for the duration of your trip. Now, if you're planning on going and it's gonna expire, get an MOT done before you go. If your vehicle is less than three years old, it won't yet have an MOT. So it's really important you check the date of first registration on your V5, and that will tell you when the MOT is due. If it's due in a few months time, get it done early. That's absolutely fine, but it must be done every year, which means you're gonna to have to return the vehicle to the UK to have 
a new MOT. You must also have valid road tax while you're traveling in Europe, uh, which of course is a UK thing, but it must be road taxed as well. You should also make sure you've got valid motor insurance with adequate European cover. Something we don't have in the UK is an agreed statement of facts on motor vehicle accident. You must carry one of these with you. I would suggest take a few. If you're very unlucky, you must always have a blank one with you. And just keep these all together in your file. And this records any detail of the accident. It records the weather conditions, the road conditions, and both parties sign it and this will be invaluable in any insurance claim. I'd also think about European breakdown cover as well. Now, motorhomes have specific breakdown cover. The RAC do a scheme called Arrival. You obtain that by joining the Camping and Caravanning Club, and then you become an RAC Arrival member. I've been a member for over 25 years and have had some very, very large motorhomes that have broken down, relayed back home. You can bolt on the European cover and make sure the dates of your trip are within the cover. You no longer need a green card to travel in Europe if you are a British citizen. This was something that was introduced when we left Europe and it's since been abolished. Right, so that's all the paperwork done. Now it's about kitting out your motorhome. And there's a few things we need to dress the motorhome with in terms of stickers. One of the new ones is the Angle Mort sticker. Now these, this is slightly bigger than the real thing. There must be three of these on your motorhome if it weighs more than three and a half tons. Now, if you're in a motorhome that's less than that, you might choose to put them on anyway, just to pacify any passing policeman. They need to go on the sides at the front and one on the back on the French curbside. You can buy them online, they're cheap enough. They're either stickers or magnetic. The magnetic ones will fit on the doors, on the cab, but you'll need a sticker one for the rear wall of the motorhome. The other sticker you need to buy is a UK sticker. Now, for many years, we've all put a GB sticker on the backs of our vehicles, they are no longer valid because the UK includes Northern Ireland. Now you can buy the little number plate stickers, you only need to have one on the rear, or you can buy the bigger one. Now in some countries they will require the larger one. My suggestion is to purchase one of these and then you cover all eventualities. It must be on the back of any vehicle in your rig, so if you've got a car and a caravan, they should both display it. Equally, if you've got a trailer with a vehicle on, you'll need to put one on the car, towing the trailer, the trailer itself, and the vehicle on the trailer, or vehicles on the trailer. And of course, for any other vehicle you take with you, you must take its V5, its MOT certificate, and its insurance certificate as well. Someone recently asked me why these number plate stickers are different colors. You'll see the UK is yellow, and on this one, it's white. It is for the front number plate, and this one is for the rear number plate. There you go. Next, we've got the high-vis vest. Now, anyone who can walk in your party must have access to a high-vis vest. The important thing with a high-vis vest is that it's easily accessible from within the vehicle. It can't be stuffed in the boot, or if you're towing a caravan in a locker of the caravan. If you're caught walking on the road without a vest on, you will be fined. Anyone who can walk must wear one, so a babe in arms doesn't need to have one. I love it when I see British people driving in the UK with these draped on the back of the cab seat like a badge of honour, saying, we've been to Europe. Well, you can store them there, but to be honest, you could put them above your head in a cupboard, you could put them in the glove box, so long as you can access it from inside the vehicle and have it on when you get out, you'll be absolutely fine. Headlight beam adapters. Now these are really important because these are gonna stop you blinding people coming toward you when you're driving in France because obviously you're on the other side of the road. The instructions are in the pack on how to fit them. My advice is, because we often get asked, when do I put them on? Don't leave it till you're on the channel tunnel or on the ferry. There probably isn't gonna be room for you to kneel down in front of the vehicle and fit them. The best way to fit them is read the instructions, identify your vehicle and follow the guide as to where you're gonna fit it. Now often you'll find you don't need the whole sticker, you can actually rip this bit off and you're just gonna use the circular bit. My advice is following the instructions, kneel down when you are blinded by the light, stick the sticker in the appropriate place, just to the side of the beam as indicated in here. You won't be able to see for a few minutes, so you'll need to give it a moment before you try and do the other headlight. You must have them on even in daylight hours when you're traveling on the continent. I have driven from home to the Channel Tunnel 
with these on. In fact, I think one of our cars has had them on for over a year. They do bake on after a while, so getting them off is really tricky. So you might want to take them off as soon as you get home to save damaging your headlight. Another essential is the first aid kit. You must have one of these when you're traveling in Europe. This is a specific one for the job, for a caravan and motorhome. My advice would be buy the biggest, most expensive one you can afford or accommodate because it's gonna be very well equipped. Really important you check the expiry date of the contents though. First aid kits do expire because they contain solvents and glues, so check it before you head off. I actually think one of these in any car is a really, really good idea. Another item you must legally carry is a red warning triangle. Now we carry two of these, partly because if I break down on a bend, I want the upcoming motorist to know as soon as possible that there's a stationary vehicle around that blind corner. You only need to carry one. The UK Highway Code states that you should position it 45 meters behind the vehicle. So putting it six meters behind the vehicle is not gonna serve anyone any benefit. It's worth noting that the requirement for a red warning triangle is gonna change to one of these, a flashing LED beacon. Now these have a magnetic base. That's not really very useful for a motorhome made of plastic. So you could either reach up and pop it on the roof, or you may wanna buy a selection of these and pop them on the road. Anything like this that's visual is certainly gonna help. Now I often get asked, do I need to take a breathalyzer kit with me to France? The answer is no. This was a law that was introduced and frankly ignored by the French, <laughs> who knows why, uh, but you don't need to take one. If you do choose to take one, it's a very sensible idea, just make sure they are in date. You are more likely to get in trouble for carrying an out of date breathalyzer than you are for not carrying one at all. Another requirement is a fire extinguisher. You must carry a fire extinguisher. We carry a fire blanket as well. Seems like a sensible idea. You must check the fire extinguisher is in date. It will be stamped with an expiry date and it should be inspected every year as well. So if you're traveling in a motorhome with something on the back of it that overhangs your rear number plate, such as a bike rack, or you might have a jumbo storage box, you need to display one of these. This is a chevron board and often a bike rack cover has a pocket for one of these. This is a plastic one with reflectors on uh, which are much cheaper than this aluminium one. The aluminium one is a legal requirement in Italy. If you're not going to Italy then one of these will suffice. Now which way do you display it? The chevrons must be pointing to the middle of the road you're traveling on. So on the continent it would be this way, back home it would be this way. I have never changed mine, and I bet you don't change yours either. Another requirement, which I don't have here to show you an example of, is a vignette. Now this is like a toll sticker, and you're gonna need one if you're in Switzerland, Austria, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czech Republic, or Slovakia. I'll warn you now, they are almost impossible to get off the windscreen, but they are proof that you've paid the toll to use the road, so make sure you've got one. If you're going to Estonia, you must have a pair of these. This is a wheel chock, and you must put them either side the tire or in front of the tires. It's to stop vehicles rolling away. Now, as far as I can see, I think the rules are for heavy goods vehicles or heavy motorhomes, but I would suggest taking two. There are a few pounds, take them with you. They are a legal requirement only in Estonia. So that concludes the legal stuff that you need to take with you. Now, a few things that I think you'll find really useful. For example, a two pin plug adapter for your hookup lead. Some rural campsites or older campsites are still using the two pin plug rather than the blue C form plug. So these Shuko plug adapters are really useful if you're on one of those sites, it means you can still hook up. A very sensible addition to your kit is one of these. This is an electrical plug tester. Now this particular one, you simply plug it into the motorhome or the caravan, and when it's hooked up and all is well, all three lights will come on. That tells me that the live and neutral are around the right way and the earth is connected as well. Some campsites you will find there is no earth, just so you're aware, you need to know that, but the live and neutral can be wired up out of phase, i.e. the wrong way round. Now that means that the live is traveling down the neutral which is not protected by your trip. So if there was a fault with an appliance in your motorhome, it wouldn't necessarily trip out. If it did trip out, there is still electric traveling down the neutral, not safe. So one of these is gonna inform you of that. Now, if, if the electric supply to the vehicle is out of phase, you could buy 
one of these. Or you can make one. This is a special little cable that I made where the live and neutral are swapped. So this end is correct, this end is incorrect. I put this on the end of my hookup lead, making the electrics safe and I get all three lights. Now gas on the continent, if you've got refillable bottles, you're gonna need a set of adapters. This is the Spanish one. There are three types of LPG adapters for different connections that you're gonna need in Spain, Italy, France, Germany, Belgium, they're all different. You can buy a whole set. This is a gas low set. So if you've got refillable gas bottles, which are a good idea, and you wanna refill your bottles, make sure you've got the adapter set. On adapters, I would also take some hose lock adapters. These are the usual tap adapters that screw onto the tap. But I've always found that on a lot of French campsites, particularly, there is no thread on the tap, it's just a spout. So one of these is a really useful addition. You just attach it to the tap, screw it up, and then you can push your hose on to refill with water. Just make sure you don't leave it behind. A tire inflator kit, this is a really good addition. You might have a spare wheel on your motorhome. You might have a tire inflator kit in lieu of a spare wheel. I take one of these as well. Particularly useful if you've got a motorbike or a car behind the motorhome. Pop this in that vehicle because undoubtedly you're gonna get a flat tire when you're 10 miles away from the motorhome where the inflator kit is kept. When you're traveling in France, you should make sure you've got green toilet chemical rather than the normal blue. Perhaps you've never used this before. The reason is a lot of French campsites have septic tanks because they're quite rural and this stuff is not gonna upset the lateral balance of the tank. You could also consider a toilet chemical like Solbio, which is a plant-based product and that equally doesn't upset the septic tank. And finally, yes, really, <laughs> a really useful item, I think, is a European sat-nav, a decent one that's up to date, uh, doesn't rely on a phone signal to work. This is the Avtex Tora 2, but there are lots on the market. Get yourself a European sat-nav, and I would consider as well a paper map. When you're sat on a campsite in the evening, there's nothing better than opening the map out and saying, well, we're here, we want to travel up this coastline and we want to get here and then plot that route into the sat-nav. You can't do that in a sat-nav, so a paper European map is a really good idea. You can pick up local ones when you're in that region and they're a great addition to have in any glove box. So sticking with technology, there are a few apps that you might find really useful as well. We use the Green Zones app, which is a way of identifying where you need a Criter sticker, so the clean air zones, and it works all across Europe and indeed in the UK as well. The Park for Night app, with a number four in the middle, is a really useful app for finding campsites uh, all across Europe, as is the Axi app, both of which have a fee. Camper Contact is another really good app as well for finding airs and campsites. And France Passion is one of many types of app where you can identify vineyards. Uh, so France Passion particularly is places of, that you can stay where there is a vineyard. There's often a charge, you need to go and spend some money, do the wine tour or spend some money in their shop and they give you a pass to stay in their car park. There are no facilities at these types of places, but they're a great way of exploring and for me, France Passion is certainly one of my favorite as I love a glass of red wine. So I trust you found that useful. Before you go, do make sure whatever vehicle you're driving, it's legal, it's safe, you've had it serviced, and it's good for the trip and ready to go. And remember, if you do need it, the emergency number on the continent is 112. You can download our free ebook checklist from thatleisureshop.com forward slash Europe. While you're there, scroll down and you are also able to buy all of the products we talked about in this video. If you've still got questions about heading off on your European adventure, then you can ask me. Go to motorhomemat.co.uk forward slash askmat. Fill out the form or even better, hit the orange button and record your question and please do tell us where you are in the world. So wherever you're headed, have a great adventure, stay safe and make sure you are fully equipped.